Please be seated. I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that most, if not all of us, have been trained to read this story as Jesus healing a guy with a mental illness, like schizophrenia or epilepsy, right? Does that sound about right? Now, it's true that in the world that would have originally heard this story, demon possession was a thing people feared. And that this story does show Jesus' power even over demonic forces, just like his power over natural forces, like the story immediately before this, where he calms the storm on the Sea of Galilee. I think it's also true that there's power in being able to hear in this story a word of hope for folks who do suffer from mental illnesses, hope that they are not beyond God's love or beyond God's help. However, I think it is equally true that if that's all this story does, we're pretty much free to ignore it. If we're not dealing with schizophrenia or depression or bipolar disorder, the story doesn't have anything to say to us. In fact, that very act of making that connection with mental illness is a way for us to glean meaning from a story that on its face has nothing at all to say to a culture that in general does not believe in the existence of demons, to say nothing of demon possession. So here's my question. What if this story is actually important? What if this story is for all of us? What if it's about something else, something more? What if this really is actually a story about demon possession? Not the exorcist kind or the, the pointy tail and pitchfork kind, but possession by those de demonic forces that resist God's work in the world. As we approach this story today, of all days, on June 19th, I am especially thinking, as I read this story, about racism. I'm thinking about the systemic reality that is so deeply embedded in our cultural DNA that it's almost a part of us, that it, in some very real way, possesses us, causes us to act in ways that are harmful to ourselves and the people around us. Racism is a ghost that haunts us, a specter appearing out of the woodwork to terrify and, tra and traumatize us again and again. It's a malevolent spirit that drives our thinking and our actions almost without us realizing it. Doesn't that sound a little bit like a demon? So as I read this story today, Juneteenth, that's what's on my mind. And I think about how on this date in 1865, one of those demons, slavery, was exercised from our country as the last enslaved people in Texas and Louisiana were finally emancipated. For that reason, Juneteenth is a celebration. It's the anniversary of freedom and release, the proclamation of good news. But I can't help but notice that in this story, not everyone is celebrating, are they? The man who is possessed, or we might say enslaved, he certainly celebrates. He shows his gratitude by sitting at Jesus' feet, by begging, begging to remain with him, to continue to be his disciple. And when Jesus sends him home, back to his family and his community, he goes gladly, proclaiming how much Jesus had done for him. But that's not how everyone else reacts, is it? The rest of the Gerasenes, the swineherds and the people of the city and the folks from the surrounding countryside, they are afraid. They see this notorious dem demoniac sitting clothed and in his right mind, and they ask Jesus to leave. Why is that? How is this not good news? Why is this wondrous healing met with hostility and resistance. Where's the celebration, the awe, the gratitude? We can only imagine that the Gerasenes also wanted this man to be healed. St. Luke gives us the impression that this so-called man of the city would frequently be seized by this demon, or demons as we learn, 
that his friends and neighbors would try to restrain him and protect him with shackles and chains so that he wouldn't harm himself by gashing himself with rocks and running off naked into the wilds. They wanted this demon gone as much as he did, didn't they? René Girard wonders about that. Girard was a 20th century French historian, philosopher, and anthropologist, and he sees in Christian scripture a response to humanity's cycle of violence. Girard points out that the man, under the influence of the demons, acts out the typical fate to which criminals are sentenced in this society. He runs away into the wilds, he stones himself, and then he hangs out in the cemetery where the dead people are. He's miming the expulsion and execution that his society uses to punish people who are considered evil. And Girard also notices that in trying to save or protect this man, his community is still inflicting violence upon him, chaining and shackling him just like they would a criminal. And so this whole scenario, Girard thinks, is a symbolic representation of how human beings try to overcome violence with more violence. The violent resistance of the garrisons, however, is ineffective. The man continues to escape, and they continue to chase him and catch him and bind him. Their violent response can't solve the problem of his violence. Girard notices that the garrisons have made this man a scapegoat. Their problem, from their perspective, is this man and the demon that possesses him. Their own violence, then, is justified as a defense against this evil, to restrain this evil in one place and neutralize it. What they can't see is that their violence is no different from the violence the man commits against himself. Perhaps their problem isn't the guy with the demon. And that's where Jesus comes in. He solves this problem that the violence of the community cannot. And he does it by nonviolent means. Instead of force, he commands the demon to leave. And did you notice? He even shows the demons mercy by granting their request not to be cast into the abyss. By how he addresses and solves the situation, Jesus reveals that the garrison solution, violently hunting and binding the man, is both ineffective and unnecessary. He shows that their violence against this man is not a solution, but part of the problem. By healing the man, he removes their scapegoat and forces them to face the truth that even with this man healed, the problem isn't gone. The problem is not one demoniac, it's an entire violent system in which they willingly participate and which they actively perpetuate. Jesus comes and upsets their delicate balance. And they don't like having their own guilt and their own complicity exposed, and so they ask him to leave instead of celebrating the healing and restoration of this man. Instead of a cause for celebration, this is a judgment against the Gerasenes. Just like the emancipation of African Americans was a judgment against the many people who benefited from their enslavement. From plantation owners, to slave traders, to textile mills, to merchants. I'll bet those folks weren't celebrating on June 19th, 1865 either. In fact, I bet a lot of them were pretty afraid. This exorcism is a wake-up call to the folks of Gerasa to recognize the system in which they are entrenched and the need to escape it. Even as Jesus declares freedom to this formerly possessed man, he also exposes the enslavement, or we might even say the possession, of an entire society to this demonic system. There's not just one demon here. There's a whole legion. Likewise, Juneteenth is a celebration for black folks. But for white folks, it's a call to acknowledge how long racism has prevailed in our society. 
how much work remains to be done to address it. I think this story also forces us to acknowledge that for us, racism isn't a problem that can be solved by law and order, by institutional violence against people who commit wrongs, by folks who would consider evil. We would like for us, we would like for there to be scapegoats, just racist people who we can fix. We'd like for there to be just one demon that we can chain up, but that's not how this works. That's the system in which racism was first enshrined. That's the house that racism built. If we're going to find a way out, we need to find another way, a nonviolent way, a merciful way to move forward. As I look at this story, I notice that the solution to the problem of the demons in Garasa does not come from within that community. It comes from a foreigner, a Jew from the other side of the sea, who shows up and offers an alternative. I wonder if maybe that's another reason that people ask him to leave. Because his solution takes away their power to deal with their own problem. We don't really like to give up power even if that power is, like this power of the Gerasenes in this story, impotent. It's terrifying and humiliating for these people to have to admit their powerlessness over evil, especially in front of a stranger. I wonder if maybe we too, in our fear of being powerless, might be unwilling to consider the alternative that Jesus lays before us. And so if we read this text simply as the healing of a man with a mental illness, I think we let ourselves off the hook, allow ourselves to be blinded like the Gerasenes to the painful truth that we are all possessed by forces and systems that are opposed to God's will and God's work. Forces that our not-so-naive ancestors might have called demonic. However, if we are willing to see ourselves in this text, I think it holds good news for us, for all of us, because it testifies to the truth that God is able to help us escape those forces and systems, just as Jesus does both for the man who lived among the tombs as well for his entire community. But notice how differently those two parties respond. The man rejoices in his freedom and proclaims, actively proclaims what Jesus has done for him. Proclaims Jesus' nonviolent way. His compatriots, on the other hand, reject and avoid Jesus. I wonder what the difference is there. I wonder why one acts one way and the other's another. What is it that keeps the Gerasenes from experiencing that same freedom and joy? is the man who'd been suffering. I wonder if this good news that Jesus brings requires us to give something up. Maybe not altogether unlike the good news of emancipation required white folks to give something up. What is it that kept those folks from celebrating with the emancipated people in 1865? What results from the resistance of both of these groups to the good news. Personally, I think that before we can move forward as a society and as a country, those are questions we need to answer. I don't have those answers, but I do believe that the answers, whatever they might be, are found in Jesus himself. That's what the man in the story sees. I wonder if maybe that might be the source of his joy I notice that separated as he was from his people and his family, he begs, what he wants most is to be with Jesus, to be one of his disciples. And it sounds like Jesus turns down that request, doesn't it? But what St. Luke actually says in Greek is that he turns him loose or sets him free to proclaim how much God has done for him. And that's just what he does 
With one important exception, he proclaims how much Jesus has done for him because he understands that what Jesus has done is what God is doing. And so I think that our way forward is Jesus' way because Jesus' way is God's way. In the Mishnah, the commentary on the law, it is written, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. I wonder what that might look like for you, for us. Where and how is Jesus calling us forward? How will we respond to that call? How might Jesus be turning you loose today?